Well, I want to say hi and welcome you. Um, obviously, we've had an interruption to our usual schedule of services. I'm really glad we're getting to spend some time together online. And uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about something that I think is important to us, not just in terms of how we think about uh, spiritual things, how we think about our own development in them. And so um, I'm actually going to cover, believe it or not, an entire book of the Bible today. That doesn't mean the message will be long, but it's a phenomenal story, and it's found, it's called the Book of Esther. And uh, the story of Esther takes place while God's people are actually living in exile. Uh, they've been captured from their own homeland, and uh, they've been taken to serve other nations. And so that's how this takes place. You can actually read about the return of those Israelites to the nation of Israel in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, the story of Esther actually takes place between chapter 6 and chapter 7 of the book of Ezra. At that time, Xerxes is king. And uh, he's a very powerful man. Uh, he is... Uh, a very influential person. He's a very charismatic person. There's some other things that are true about him as well. So I'd like us to think about uh, our conversation today in this regard. Do you know what your mission is in life? You can do without a lot of things in life, but it is hard to live life without meaning. If we have no mission, we'll always feel like we're just wandering. It's one thing to know you're off track. It's another thing to think there is no track. So how do you find your mission, the sense and reason for why you are here? And um, there's a lot of things that we don't know. I'd like to talk about that and then how we can find our mission. We don't know what opportunities God is going to provide in our life. We don't know what kind of opportunities God will provide in our life. In chapter 1, this great king likes to throw great parties. Huge. Lots of people. Wine is flowing. And in his drunken state, he comes up with an idea. His idea is that he wants to show everyone who's at this party how beautiful his wife, the queen, is. And he wants to parade her out in front of everyone who is in a drunken state. And so he launched this idea to his queen, and she said no. And uh, kings aren't used to being told no. That didn't go so well. And the concern was is that if she said no and no consequence occurred, then he would look weak. And when you're king, you can't ever look weak. And so all these people are drinking without restraint. The only person in the room who's showing any restraint is Esther. So the, the king goes to his counselors and he says, you know, do you have any recommendations on how to handle this? And they just basically said, what you need to do is forbid her to ever have any access to you ever again, and you need a new queen. You just swap her out for someone who will do what you have asked. And that takes us into chapter 2. So the king finally sobers up, and he's a little less angry now, and he realizes he has no queen. So he goes back to his counselors and says, you know, what's a good strategy for finding the next queen? And they suggested that there would be a beauty contest. Uh, this kingdom had 127 provinces. That would be like states for us. And so each state would have their own contest and they would select the most beautiful woman from their province and they would send all 127 of these women for the king to have a contest and select who was the most beautiful woman in all the land and that would become the queen. One of those girls that was selected in one of those provinces, her name was Esther. Uh, interestingly enough, her parents had died when she was a child. She was actually raised by a cousin and his name was Mordecai. And so people saw that she was beautiful. They recommended that she participate. She did. She wound up not just winning the province. She wins the whole contest. So we don't know what kind of opportunity. She had no idea this was coming. 
That's another thing we don't know. We don't know what kind of dangers we will face. This is chapter 3. There's a man that works for the king. He's a high official. His name is Haman. And Haman is a very capable person. He's very loyal to the king. And as a result, the king has elevated him to a position that is above all the other uh, royal uh, guard or, or the people that serve the king. He has the highest position of any one of those individuals. And so the king said, whenever anyone sees Haman, you should bow down to him. And every day he would walk through the gate, and when he walked through the gate, there would be a man standing there, and it's Mordecai. And the fact that he's there shows that he is also a royal official. This was kind of the, the place royal officials would meet and have conversations. And Mordecai will not bow down. He won't do it. He's not doing it just because he doesn't like Haman. He's not doing it because he serves the true and the living God, and, and you don't treat people like gods. And uh, Haman doesn't appreciate uh, his religion or his perspective or any of those things. And it so angers him. He doesn't, th this will tell you a lot about Haman. He doesn't just want to do harm to Haman. He wants to eliminate the entire ethnic group that Haman comes from. This is what he goes about. So he comes up with a plan. And the plan is to exterminate every single Jewish person in 127 provinces on the same day. He goes to the king and he tells him, there's a group of people, they really don't belong in your kingdom. They're not worthy. They're a problem. And something should be done about them. And so the king says, well, what do you think should be done? And he told him, they should be exterminated. And then he does this. It's basically a bribe. He tells the king, I will contribute towards this cause and towards your treasury 375 tons of silver. 375 tons of silver. This is the equivalent of the entire revenue of all the taxes from all the nations that contribute to the kingdom in the course of an entire year. He is going to spend, to give to the king, 375 tons of silver to eliminate this entire ethnic group. Mordecai did not know what dangers he would face. Esther did not know what dangers she was going to face. We also don't know what our mission is going to be in life. And this takes us to chapter 4. Mordecai, because he's a royal official, hears of this plot. And he doesn't just grieve privately or flee the scene. He actually begins to weep publicly. And he calls people around him that are part of his, his people to pray and to seek God. And he also goes to Esther, who's the queen to see if there's anything she can do to help. And Esther's not particularly happy right now about this opportunity because for an entire month, by this point in the story, the king has not requested to see her. There have been no dinners together. There have been no conversations. There have been no intimacy. He's been preoccupied with other things. And she's beginning to wonder if maybe she's replaceable too. Maybe the king wants someone else instead. So she'd not seen him. She's not sure if she has any influence with him any longer. And Mordecai begins to speak to his cousin Esther, and he begins to tell her, you may have thought that your highest calling was to be a beauty pageant winner and wear a tiara, but there's more to you than that. There's more to you than accomplishing uh, and, and, and sporting the, the latest fashion designs. There's more to you and more for you to accomplish than just to live in luxurious palaces. There's more for you to accomplish than settling for gourmet dinners and social occasions. This is what he tells her. You have been called to deliver people. You have been called to save lives. You have been called to make a difference. He tells her this. He tells her this. She had no idea what her mission was, and now she's hearing something for the first time. So what do we need if we're going to 
discover and live out our mission in life. And the first thing I would tell you is you're going to want, you're going to need someone who will speak truth to you. That's what Mordecai is doing for Esther, speaking truth. In Esther, the fourth chapter, verse 12, it says this, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows? This is it in a nutshell. Who knows? But that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. There it is. Someone is speaking the truth to her and, and revealing, helping her to see what her mission is in life. He tells her, don't think you're exempt to this threat. If you are passive, if you are apathetic right now, it can be a destructive force in your life. Can be for us too. Maybe this is where you discover your reason for being here, your purpose in life, your mission in life. Maybe God has brought you to this moment for a reason. So the question I have for you, who is the person in your life that speaks truth to you like that? Who is the person in your life that speaks truth to you like that? If you don't have that person, it's going to be really hard to find your purpose and your mission in life. If you want to discover your mission in life, you will need courage. This comes from the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 15. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, that's one of the provinces, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will do as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, and even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. In that moment, she's leaning into courage. Um, kings were always at risk of being assassinated. And so if you walked into the throne room uninvited, there were people whose job it was to take your life very quickly. The only hope of survival is if the king suddenly, instantly decided that nothing should be done and he would point his scepter at you and then that would be a sign to everyone else who's responsible for the king's safety to leave you alone. Some of the boldest words ever recorded in all of scripture are not spoken by a military commander or a warrior. They're spoken by a beauty pageant winner. I will go in even though it is not lawful. And if I perish, I perish. Can you imagine the kind of fear that's just coursing through her when she's about to walk through those doors? She already knew there was a death sentence on her. If you knew you had just a few days left to live, would you do anything to shorten even the very brief time that you have? Well, she did. She enters the room, and the king actually extends his scepter towards her, and he's happy to see her. And, and so this is where it gets really interesting, because now she needs to be strategic. She needs to be really cautious about, about this, which is another thing that we need. If you want to discover your mission in life, you're going to need courage, but you're also going to need wisdom. Okay? There are people who are courageous, and they die. And she needs to be courageous, but she also needs wisdom. So she had called to fast. She'd asked people to seek God on her behalf. And she needs to be intelligent about what happens next. And so when the king says, I'm thrilled to see you, what can I do for you? She says, I would like you and Haman to come to a dinner. I've already set it up. And remember, this king likes to party. And Haman likes to be included in important situations. And so they go to the dinner. And while the king is drinking wine, because this king does a lot of that, 
he asked her, what is it that you want? And she said, well, I'd like to invite you and Haman to one more dinner, an even bigger and better dinner tomorrow, and then I'll tell you and make clear what I really desire. And so the king is a little bit excited about this, and, and Haman is thrilled. I mean, he's getting to spend amazing time with the two most powerful and important people in the entire kingdom. Uh, she's using wisdom. This is what James tells us. If anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to them. What is that telling us? Wisdom is not a matter of your IQ. Wisdom is a matter of your willingness to ask God for help. And he does it without finding fault. He doesn't look at us and say, well, you're deserving of what's happening right now. That's not what he does. So Esther knows her husband loves a party, so she schedules two of them. She's being wise. One more thing. If you want to discover your mission in life, you're going to need timing. Timing. Um, they leave that party. Everybody's kind of happy. Um, the king goes to bed and tries to go to sleep. He's unable to do so. Mordecai goes home, and he's all riled up because the closer he's gotten to this kind of power, the less tolerance he has for people like Mordecai. He's not even willing to wait just the few days it's going to take for the entire Jewish race to be killed in 127 provinces. So the king is laying in bed and he, he can't sleep and so he asks that the official minutes of the kingdom be brought and read to him. <laughs> it's kind of like really boring things and, and people have been using this strategy for a long time. Just, just uh, focus on something boring and maybe you'll get tired and fall asleep. And so they're reading through a series of events and included in the events that they happen to pull out and read to him that night was a story of an attempted assassination plot against him. There were two eunuchs that worked in the, king, in the palace, and they had put together a plot to kill the king, and Mordecai was actually the person who became aware of it. And when he became aware of it, he reported it, they investigated it, they found it was true, and the king's life was spared, and these two individuals, they, their life was forfeit. And so the king is listening to the, these minutes, and he goes, what did we ever do for that guy, Mordecai? Like, what was the reward for saving my life? And, and they looked through and they said, yeah, we didn't do anything. And he said, well, that's not right. And so he's, I've got to fix that. And then he goes to sleep. Uh, Haman, remember, had wanted Mordecai dead. And so when he goes home, he's kind of ranting to his wife and she says, you don't have to wait. Look how important you are in the kingdom. I mean, you're having dinner with the king and queen. Just go ahead and build a gallows and have the guy killed. And so he thinks that's a great idea, and he builds a gallows. And this is no ordinary gallows. He builds a gallows that's 75 feet tall because he's going to make a statement. And so that's what he's doing throughout the day. He comes in at the end of his work day to see the, the, the king and, and the king says, uh, he said, what do you think should be done for a person that the king wants to honor? And, and Haman goes, oh, he's, he's thinking about me. The king wants to honor me. And so he comes up with a very, very exotic plan. He says, well, I would take some of the king's own clothing and put it on him. And I would have him sat on the king's own royal horse. And then I would have a high-ranking noble in the kingdom lead the horse with this guy on the horse and wearing the king's robe and the crown, all of it, and have that noble yell out to everyone in the city as you're leading along. This is what the king does for someone that he wants to reward. And, and the king says, that is a great idea. Okay, the guy I want to reward, his name is Mordecai, and you can be the official that, that leads the horse. And Haman is devastated. Something is going horribly wrong. So he does this. He goes home. He has a conversation with his wife. 
he's starting to get an uneasy feeling. Things are not going to go the way that he wanted. And at dinner later that evening with Esther and the king, Esther goes to the king and she says, what I wanted to talk to you about is that there is someone who is trying to kill me and all of my people. And he said, who, who would do that? She said, if it was just about imprisoning us or turning us all into slaves, I wouldn't even bother the king. But this person wants to exterminate every single one of us. He said, who would do that? And she said, it's Haman. And the king is so enraged in the moment, he doesn't trust himself, and he gets up and he walks out into the garden. Haman has nowhere left to go. He is shaken. Suddenly the tables have turned. He didn't see this coming. And he throws himself, not just at the floor where Esther is, she's kind of reclining on a couch. He throws himself on Esther. And he's pleading, you have to save my life. Don't let this happen to me. And the king happens to come in from the garden right then. And it looks like Haman is trying to rape his wife, the queen. And that's it. The king gives the order, and he has Haman hung on his own gallows. His life is over. And Esther looks at the king and says, you're going to need a new chief of staff. And he said, who do you have in mind? She said, Mordecai proved his loyalty to you once. So Mordecai is brought in, and Mordecai and Esther co-write legislation that allows all the Jewish people to protect themselves if there's any attack against them. And as a result, no one attacks them. Ecclesiastes, the eighth chapter, says this, whoever obeys the Lord's command will come to no harm. And the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a man's misery weighs heavily upon him. You can see how God was at work through the timing so that Esther could live out her mission. You are where you are. You are who you are. You have what you have been given for a reason. God has an intended purpose for your life. You may not know what it is, but even right now, God is at work in your life, and you might not be seeing all the details of it. Esther didn't know when she was invited to participate in a beauty contest, she would wind up being the deliverer of her people. Mordecai happened to overhear a plot against the king, and when he follows up and reports on it, the king's life is spared. On the night that the king couldn't sleep, of all the volumes that they could have selected to read the official minutes to the king to help make him sleep, the one book that they pulled out and the one page that they turned to was the book where the, uh, and the page where the king's life was spared because of a man named Mordecai. So the king decides, I need to reward this person, and he follows through on that reward. The king happens to walk in right as Haman is falling on top of his wife, laying on the couch. And it can seem like these are all coincidences, and yet God is at work. He has a mission. He has a purpose. There's meaning to your life. And there's a lot of things that might seem coincidental. But what if these were divine provisions and divine appointments for you to live out what God intended? I want to pray with you today. It's entirely possible you don't have a sense of that mission. That life seems a lot more random to you. And what I want you to know is that God isn't a random God. He's at work in ways that we don't know. And if you will bring people who will speak truth into your life, if you're willing to exercise some courage, if you're willing to seek wisdom, it's amazing what God can do. So Father, 
today kind of reminds us there's lots of things we're not in control of. There's nothing that you cannot work towards your will. Help us be the kind of people who seek truth tellers out. Help us be the kind of people who won't wait until we feel completely confident before we will stand up or speak up. Help us to be the kind of people who will seek wisdom and help us to be the kind of people who will trust in your timing. We want to live out your purpose in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.